It's always my pleasure to be in Dania, the, the oldest city in Broward County. And, you know, uh, I, the way I got involved with hurricanes uh, was not the way most people that do what I do got involved with hurricanes, because almost everybody that, that works the Weather Channel that is interested in hurricanes or that I've ever worked with over the years, you know, had some hurricane hit when they were a kid. And then they got all <clears throat> jazzed about hurricanes and ended up studying it and making it their, their life's work. I got uh, involved with hurricanes. I studied meteorology, but not especially hurricanes. Um, although I did take a, a tropical uh, course at, at Florida State. But the way I got involved was in the 1980s, I was working for Channel 10, and I did a segment called Neighborhood Weather. And a lot of those segments were about the history of South Florida. And so if you study the history of South Florida, you study hurricanes. And it occurred to me at that time that if, if, uh, if I were ever chief meteorologist, which I wasn't at that time, which I became in 1990 when I went to work at WTVJ. If I were ever chief meteorologist uh, and one of those big hurricanes of the past came along, everybody was going to be looking at me and saying, uh, you know, what do we do about this? You know, what's the story? What's going to happen? And all of that. So that was how I got involved in hurricanes. And when I went to WTVJ, uh, the management there agreed that we should really study the problem. We did a lot of work on it, two and a half years worth of studying it, more than any TV station ever in history had done. And then we had this hellacious hurricane, Hurricane Andrew. So uh, a lot of my understanding of hurricanes and a lot of what I was able to do when it happened was related to understanding what had happened before. And, and I want to go back to a question that, uh, a very pertinent question that was asked out there uh, earlier. Uh, and that was the question of, of how many of you have ever been through a major hurricane? And most people raised their hands and said Hurricane Wilma, right? Well, major is a funny word because Wilma certainly was a major hurricane event. But major actually means category three and above, and, and I don't use that word because it's confusing, but that's what the technical definition of a major hurricane is, category three and above. So if I say, how many of you have ever been through a Category 3 or above hurricane here in Dania Beach? What's the answer? Nobody. Unless you were here in 1950, that was the last one. Right? And the one before that, I don't know, in Dania Beach here, maybe 1947. Maybe. Uh, so you have to go back that far before you get a Category 3 and above. So most of what you experienced in Hurricane Wilma was a Category 1. It was a high-end Category 1, but it was a Category 1. Most of what you experienced, uh, well, all of what you experienced at Katrina was a low-end Category 1 in 2005. So the point is that any hurricane that you think you've experienced is a low-end hurricane event in terms of of uh, what hurricanes can do here in South Florida, and uh, uh, you know, not to mention Hurricane Andrew that, that we're going to talk about today. So it's really important to understand the hurricane history. We have been spectacularly fortunate in our adult lifetimes that we haven't had to deal with this very much. It's been incredibly calm. In, in the United States in general, it's been a relatively disaster-free 50 years you just think about it, we haven't had any massive earthquakes that destroyed cities. We haven't had big hurricanes uh, that uh, destroyed cities. Now, Katrina, you might say, but that was an engineering disaster, not a hurricane disaster that destroyed New Orleans. Now, Katrina did horrible things in Mississippi, and other storms have been really, really bad in suburban areas, including Andrew, didn't hit downtown Miami. But we, so we've been spectacularly lucky. But if you go back to the 1940s, 1945, a Category 4 hurricane hit Dade County. 1947, a Category 4 hurricane hit Broward. Hit North Broward, went right through uh, Pompano Beach today. That was the core of it. But it affected Miami significantly. It was a big storm. Affected all of Palm Beach County, all of Broward County, and even into Dade County. 1948, a Category 3 hurricane hit over on the West Coast, kind of like uh, Wilma, and came across. And then another one came across that year. In fact, in 47, there were two as well the Category 4 and a Category 1. In 49, a Category 4 hit Palm Beach County. And in 1950, a Category 4 hit Dade. It was a Category 3 by the time it got to Broward. 
So just in those years there, it was bing, 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 one after the other. So it can happen. Historically, it can happen. But it hasn't happened. So we have been, you really have to think of us as, as being in this hurricane drought. So using our experience with hurricanes to predict the future is not a good thing. So let me talk about Andrew. Uh, the uh, friends of the library there had this book, um, and, and I just was looking through it. I, I haven't seen it in years. It's a wonderful, wonderful book put out by the Herald, uh, Andrew, The Hurricane That Changed Everything. And it really is true, because it was so extreme, and things happened in Hurricane Andrew that, uh, that we didn't even expect would happen. It was so much worse than we thought it would be. There was no reason to think that a storm that strong couldn't happen in this part of the world. It happened in 1935, and, and very, very strong storms have happened here over the years uh, a number of times. But this one was the first modern one, so it was measured and observed, and we saw things happen that we didn't, we didn't know. We didn't know the internal workings of hurricanes in many ways until Andrew. And it, of course, it changed the insurance system, and it changed the building code, and it changed emergency management, and it changed so many things. So in many ways, Andrew really is the storm that changed everything. My book, so that's my book, my Hurricane Andrew story. It's just my Hurricane Andrew story. It's not the Hurricane Andrew story, because everybody that went through it especially in South Dade, has a Hurricane Andrew story. So I'm telling mine about, about what we did at the TV station, how we got our, uh, ourselves ready, what we went through, what I saw afterward, people I met afterward. If, uh, if you were here, uh, I, I hope you, you enjoy the story. It was, uh, it, it was a project. It was a project uh, to write. And anyway, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. By the way, it's available on Amazon. It's the only place it's available. All right, so Hurricane Andrew. Uh, I'm going to tell you, in fact, I'm going to skip to the end of the book, and I'm going to tell you what the conclusion of the book is and give you, and as a way of giving you a little preview. The conclusion of Hurricane Andrew and the number one lesson is that the worst does happen. You know, storms just don't always jog away from the coast like Hurricane uh, Matthew did last year. They just don't always do that. They don't always weaken when they're coming ashore. As a matter of fact, Hurricane Andrew strengthened as it was coming ashore and continued to strengthen over Southern Dade County. So that just because it's coming over to land or if, if you live, you know, I mean, you folks live near the coast, so it doesn't make any difference. But if people that live in Weston think, oh, it'll be weaker by the time it gets there. Not necessarily. Often, but not necessarily. And it really can be worse than you can imagine. You know, the sort of good thing is Hurricane Andrew happened 25 years ago. We have a lot of evidence of it. I'm going to talk a lot about it. You can learn a lot about it. Uh, and, and the bottom line is if you can understand Hurricane Andrew and be ready for Hurricane Andrew, you can be ready for pretty much anything. Right? I mean, it's that extreme an event. The second lesson is the preparation works. The reason that WTVJ, if you were here and you listened on the radio to, uh, what, uh, to our broadcast, the only reason that we were on the radio is because we had done preparation. I talk about the, our connection with Y100 and how that happened in the book. Uh, in fact, um, uh, it's a whole section of the book about it. Uh, the reason that, that we could do that and the other stations could not is because we had prepared with a special line to Y100. When Channel 10 and Channel 7, well, Channel 7 had to evacuate the studio. When Channel 10 and Channel 6's tower went down, they didn't have any backup system. They hadn't prepared. So preparation works. What you do ahead of the storm has so much to do with what happens afterward. So it's, it's a, you know, if you're going to live in this climate, in this environment, it's just, uh, it's everything. And the idea is to imagine everything. What can go wrong? You know, one of the things that can go wrong very, very easily is your car can get wrecked and you don't have any transportation, and it's not easy to get transportation after a hurricane. So thinking out just the very simple thing of where am I going to park my car is a, is a, a very important thing. Uh, and I can't tell you how many thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of cars were ruined in South Dade and people were stranded. It's a horrible thing to be stranded after a hurricane. So, so just the idea is look around your house, your environment, wherever you live, and just imagine everything and try and think, think it out. Just thinking it out. It's not fretting over it. It's not, it's not you know, losing sleep over it. 
It's thinking it out ahead of time, and you'll feel so much better when it happens mm -hmm. if you do that. So let's, uh, let's talk about Andrew, uh, and if Andrew were to happen again, would it be, how different would it be, and, and what would be the same, and what would be different? So this was five days out, 120 hours, five days. And there's a satellite picture. It was really just a smudge on the satellite picture. It was this very weak system. There was very high shear, in other words, unfavorable atmospheric conditions for development right away. The models were diverging, like some taking it north, uh, a couple untested ones taking it more westerly. But if that were to happen again, the models would not handle it well. It would be one of those things where the spaghetti plots would be kind of going everywhere. It would be very uncertain because storms that are not well organized are much poorly, more poorly forecast. There would be a cone today, 120 hours out, because that's five days, right? But the uh, confidence in the cone would be low because weak storms just have low confidence. Four days out now, the, the uh, reconnaissance went out there and found no circulation. The rules say if there's no circulation, you take the name off the storm and you downgrade it to a tropical disturbance. They did not do that. Bob Sheets, who's the director of the National Hurricane Center, then said, no, let's hold on because it might be confusing if it comes back. And if we take the names out, people let down their guard or won't pay attention or whatever, and, and it'll be confusing if we put it back, which he was right. But today, the rules are very clear. If there is no circulation, there is no name. So. Still on Thursday, it was very disorganized. Any forecast would have low confidence. Forecast might be aimed toward, toward Dania Beach, but it would be a low confidence forecast. There would be no reason to put in really any energy into worrying about that forecast, but it's only four days out. And just think, now we're used to really, I mean, they would be on TV talking about it nonstop. Uh, you know, on social media would be just nonstop at this point. And models would diverge again because they always do in disorganized storms. All right, three days out. Now it's a tropical storm, 60 mile an hour tropical storm. Uh, it doesn't look very threatening there on the satellite picture, although the reconnaissance is showing it's developing. And it's due east of Miami at that point. There was a sense back then, and, and a lot of people in the hurricane world think now, that once it gets to your latitude, because storms always kind of turn to the north, that you're good, right? Andrew proved that's not true, right? So, but, but so, if, you know, we have to be careful here because if it were on that latitude, we would have a sense probably by that Friday that, that Florida was threatened. I think the cone would be aiming at, at uh, Florida in the uh, future if this were to happen again, but no more Dania Beach, then West Palm Beach, then Fort Pierce, then Miami, but just, it, it, you know, it would be aiming this way uh, probably with high pressure building in the north. That's three days out. Remember, this thing hits Sunday night, overnight Sunday night, right? So Saturday, now you have a hurricane Saturday morning. So two days, exactly two days before it hit, exactly 48 hours before it hit, it became a hurricane for the first time and a category one, 75 miles per hour. Just think two days ahead of storms now, two days ahead of Matthew, five days ahead of Matthew that was already talking about it. This is only two days ahead. It would be a sense that of a threat to the southern part of the peninsula of Florida. Uh, it was a well-defined storm, but it's a tiny storm, so exactly where it hits is super important. The forecast would threaten Florida, but two days out, the forecast could not distinguish between Miami and West Palm Beach, two days out. The cone would be from South Florida to Central Florida, or Treasure Coast, something like that. And then one day out, it's this mega storm. Uh, it hit the Bahamas at 170 miles an hour is the modern estimate. Uh, where exactly is it gonna hit? Of course, a lot of people in Broward went to Kendall if they were near the coast. Right, because they, they had a sense, oh, you know, it's safer there. But one day out with 2017 technology, we cannot distinguish between Miami and Fort Lauderdale. So it's not about trying to dodge it. it just, that, that idea is not a good idea. The, the best idea is to find a place safe, close to where you are and protect yourself 
and your property to the extent you can, and including your car and, and, and whatever you're going to need after the storm. The technology does not, I don't make, care where the little line is, just like we saw Matthew jog 50 miles. Uh, you know, 50 miles, just think, it's only 20, it's not even 25 miles from Miami, downtown Miami to here. Right? So a little jog like that can make all that difference, and modern technology cannot uh, distinguish between the, those kinds of, of places in a forecast a day out, and it never will, not at least in our lifetime, or probably our kids' lifetime. So number one thing is uh, for preparation is to really think it through. Like I said, really think it out. What am I going to do? What am I going to do if this is a threat? What am I going to do if it's... If it's really coming, you know, what, what am I going to do? That's the, the question. Because these are the things that you, you don't ever want to have happen to you. You don't want to have the inability to escape. You know, you don't want to get trapped in your neighborhood. So high rises, for example, I mean, you don't have a lot of that here, but uh, maybe some of you folks uh, live in, in high rises. High rises, modern high rises now, modern high rises built in the last 20 years are safe buildings, they're very, very safe buildings, as are houses built in the last 20 years, very, very safe buildings. But in a high rise, you would still want to stay in an interior hallway on the second or third floor. That would be the safest place in a high rise. But you could get stranded in your high rise. What happens if the ocean comes in and, and uh, the streets are impassable, no ambulances, no police can come get you. So that's why they evacuate the beach areas, is they don't want people stranded on the beach, you could be stranded on the beach for a week or more, with no accessibility. So that's why they move people away from the water, because the storm surge comes in with all the debris and sand, and now no rescue vehicles, no nothing can get there. And so the, the idea is to get people away. So you don't want to get trapped or you have the inability to escape. What do you, how are you going to communicate? I mean, you know, that's a big problem now. Everybody's got a cell phone, right? Um, and. Um, um, Many, many people, probably most, more than half the people, although I see a lot of older folks in here, and we still have landlines of one kind or the other, a lot of us, but most often, they're not real landlines. They go over the cable. They're like the Comcast triple play or something like that. That's not a landline. That's electricity-dependent phone service. So the old landlines were not electricity-dependent. They worked even when the electricity went out. Those, those don't. So very few people today have landlines, and the cell phone system will not work after a hurricane. You might be able to text, but you almost certainly won't be able to call. So that's how you're going to communicate and, and uh, who you're going to text and, and let them communicate and work all that out ahead of time. That's really important. Don't get stuck with the inability to communicate. How are you going to be informed? You know, my kids, neither of them have transistor radios. The young people don't have transistor radios. A lot of people don't have transistor radios anymore. That is, that is really the only way to be informed after a storm. There is no other way. Because if the phone doesn't work, what are you going to do? How are you, how are you going to be informed, know what's going on? A transistor radio is it. And they, they, what do they cost? They, they cost less than 10 bucks. And the good thing these days is that flashlights and transistor radios use so much less energy than they did 25 years ago. It doesn't take, you don't have to have a whole garage full or closet full of batteries to keep yourself powered for a week. You can easily uh, keep yourself powered uh, with a, a reasonable number of batteries. Uh, LED flashlights run for days and days and days, and lanterns. So you don't have to be without light. You don't have to be without information. But you've got to figure it out ahead of time. And how, how are you going to, you know, the inability to take care of yourself. If something happens, you know, your friends and your whoever is going to do it, those are the, those are the things that, that you've got to try and solve. Is, how are you going to not get stuck in one of those uh, kind of situations? So let's just talk for a second about this idea I was mentioning about where it was going. Um, the Wednesday before Hurricane Andrew, I introduced uh, the quasi-cone, didn't call it that at the time, but that was the, the beginning of the cone. And you can kind of get an idea that that, that day, which was, uh, like I said, uh, Wednesday, you know, somewhere, remember the forecast was only three days ahead at that time. They didn't do five-day forecasts, which I, I wish they would go back to three-day forecasts. But between Cuba and, and kind of going up north and out to sea, <laughs> you know, the errors were very big. Well, the National Hurricane Center has run the modern technology uh, on Hurricane Andrew. 
Now, so this is the, so you can actually see what a real cone would look like if the storm happened again. And this is a Saturday simulation. So this is only two days before, a little less than two days before the storm actually hit. And there's the cone. And like I said, two days out, look at it. It's all the way from Key Largo on up to uh, Vero Beach or so. And that's how big the cone would be using modern technology. And if you go back to it, it's the second H, the one that says 2 p.m. Sunday, that's one day out. And, and you can see that even if you take that across to the peninsula, that's Dade, Broward, and part of Palm Beach County is how wide the cone would be one day out. So like I said, even with, with modern science, modern computers, modern technology, the idea of trying to figure out exactly where it's going is, is a fool's errand. That's wasted energy. Preparing and being ready for anything that can happen is where all the energy uh, needs to go. That, just so you can see, there's, that's what the models looked like in 1992. So there was this big focus on uh, Palm Beach County, you can see, uh, there. And that, that was the, you know, that's why the center of the cone was there. So there was confidence. And maybe today those would be focused a little farther south. But still, you'd have this broad area. If you notice, there's one model down at the bottom that has it almost exactly right, that yellow one there. Well, that one <laughs> came in late in the day and was experimental. But the underlying data with that one was, because I, in, in 1992 at the TV station, we didn't get spaghetti models because there was no internet. And, uh, and so I didn't have this to look at at all. They had this to look at the National Hurricane Center. But the underlying data behind the, that yellow one, which says AVNO there, um, I did get. And it gave me this very broad look at the weather pattern. And that's what I was looking at that caused me concern about the, the storm coming farther south than the forecast uh, discussion at that time was. So that's why I was focused on it a little earlier than other people. It wasn't because I had spaghetti models. In fact, the Hurricane Center had spaghetti models, and, and they misled them because they didn't look at that yellow one. The yellow one was just not thought to be active. So, so the point is that, that there was uh, that this whole kind of idea of, of we have more time, we'll know exactly all that, those are, those are not real ideas. They're false ideas. We still have to be ready. We can't dodge it. Um, the modern science, just the nature of weather, you know, we live in this very compact place, and a little bit of a wiggle can make a tremendous difference, especially in a little tiny hurricane like that, where it was 20 miles wide. The, whole, the worst of it was 20 miles wide. How about the strength of the storm? How good are we with that with modern technology? Well, <clears throat> this is Hurricane Matthew last year. And you see there that the, those are the models up there, and I'll show you those, what, the, what they mean in a second. But down there, the discussion, notice they, they say only slight strengthening is predicted during the next 24 hours. It was a 70-mile-an-hour tropical storm. And they're looking in this area right here, or the next uh, of 36 hours, and I don't know if you can make it out, but that white bar is in Category 1. So all the models are keeping it a Category 1 storm within the next 36 hours, and that's why they made that statement that, okay, it'll probably strengthen to be a hurricane, but not a very strong hurricane, relatively speaking. Well, what happened? It became a Category 5. So our ability to forecast strength is also not good, and certainly not good enough to affect hurricane planning. So we plan for the reasonable worst case. If a storm is coming towards South Florida, storms can rapidly intensify as they approach here. We, we, our plans should always be for essentially worst case storms. If you're farther north, you don't have to think that way exactly. But in Florida, we have to think that way. So our hurricane plans need to be ready for uh, you know, extreme uh, hurricanes. There's a perfect example of a storm you know, in the tropics that we forecast extremely badly with the most modern technology. So what's better and worse than, than 1992? Uh, it's really a kind of a trade-off. Because things that are better are government. Government organization, emergency management, is much better than it was. It was chaotic in 1992. The governor couldn't uh, call his office that, and really didn't know between the state and the feds. They didn't know how to even get the disaster uh, process going. That now is well-oiled uh, machinery. 
intra-government communications is good. Uh, back then, the fire and the police people couldn't talk to each other. Now, different people all have common frequencies, and they all can talk to each other. New buildings are spectacularly strong. Any building built to the current Miami-Dade building code, which Broward County uses, is, is, a, is a bunker. It's great. You still don't want to stand next to the windows, but, you know, but the building is almost certainly livable after any hurricane that comes along. Be, be awfully unlucky for it to not be livable. Might have damage in a superstorm, but it would be livable. And track forecasts are much better, but they're still not good enough to, to tell you a day in advance exactly where it's going to come. Things that are worse, I think there's too much confidence in the forecast now. Right? People are looking at it and they say, oh, they say it's, it's going to hit Fort Lauderdale. Uh, or they say it's going to hit Miami, so it's okay for us. It, it's, that's nonsense, and, and, but, but you hear that kind of thing on, in the media, and, and the communications is, is not good. And so people have too much confidence in the forecast. People don't have transistor radios. It's a terrible thing. I mean, at the um, History Miami Museum, which I totally recommend you go see the Hurricane Andrew ex exhibit that opened there on Thursday. I was there Thursday night, and all these folks from South Dade, and you know, they all want to talk about we listened on the radio. I don't know what we would have done if you weren't on the radio. If you could imagine being in your closet under a mattress and having no connection to the outside world because your phone is just not working. It's the, what's your, what good's your phone going to do? Right? You, not, you don't have any uh, internet connection, whatever. Uh, it's, a, it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing to imagine. Hurricane Hugo, the year bef uh, three years before, 89, there were no radio stations or television stations on the air. And those people that went through that just didn't have any idea. People don't have real landlines. There are very few of those left that, you know, I remember being down in South Dade in the yard, everything in the neighborhood was destroyed, and there was a princess phone sitting there with a dial tone that everybody in the neighborhood used, even though the lines were all laying on the ground, because it was such a robust system and it didn't require electricity. And remember, in South Dade, and in deep South Dade, the power was out for three months. In Kendall, it was out for three weeks or so, three weeks to a month. So the idea of, of things coming back quickly and, and uh, you know, non-resilient systems being workable is not uh, a good idea. Battery TVs don't work. We don't have battery TVs these days because of digital TVs. Now, with the next generation of TV system, we'll have them again, but we don't have them now. So that's a, again, a lot of people watched on TV and their little black and white five inch TVs back in 92, that, that, they don't work anymore. And one of the most dangerous things today is that the media is, is much smaller and much less capable. The television, newspaper, radio, uh, staffing, it's, I don't know, it's probably 40% of what it was in 1992. So that, that's a tremendous deterrent. People don't have support. You, don't, you just can't be as good at what you do as a, as a reporter and work in media uh, with, um, with the staffing we have today. So the media won't be able to provide the service that uh, we were able to in 1992. So it's, a, it's a bad thing. There's a, there's a saying that, that um, I actually got through Bill Gray, Dr. Bill Gray, whose name you may know, a pioneer at Hurricane Forecast, and his, the guy who took it over from Bill is a guy named Phil Klotzbach. But it actually came from Yogi Berra, and he said, you can see a lot by looking. Right? And it's really true if you think about it. Just if you open your eyes and, and think for a minute, you can see a lot. But I revised it to say you can plan for a lot by imagining what would happen if Hurricane Andrew hits you, right? So if you think it out, if you, if you go to the uh, History Miami Museum downtown and really, it's a fantastic exhibit and, and uh, imagine that happening to your neighborhood, you know, how would you, what would you have to do to be ready? It, it turns out it's not as hard as it seems. Um, it's very hard to, have your life be perfect. <laughs> it's almost impossible to have it be perfect, but to have it, have it be a, a speed bump as opposed to a serious, serious life-changing uh, event is not as hard as, as uh, it seems. And the odds, of course, of having a Hurricane Andrew 
are very low, but if you're ready for something like a Hurricane Andrew, you're ready for anything uh, that comes along. So uh, anyway, I, I hope um, that you'll take a look at the, my Hurricane Andrew story. Um, it's, it's a combination of a lot of things about, about the storm and uh, you know, what my journey was uh, through that storm. And, and there's my uh, contact uh, information. And I, thanks very much. Thank you.